Turning to Daniel chapter number 9, Daniel chapter number 9, we're going to be um, in verses 20 through 27 today uh, as we look at another one of these prophecies that Daniel was given um, concerning the time of the end and how God is bringing everything to a logical conclusion. Um, that's what we can draw when we study prophecy about the time of the end is that everything is happening according to God's time schedule and it's going to end with Christ on the throne and his kingdom enduring forever. Amen? Amen. And that's what we're going to see here in Daniel chapter number 9, another vision. Um, but um, before we, we start reading, look at your neighbor and say, pay attention or you'll miss something today. <laughs> All right. All right, now pay attention for real, and we'll get started um, reading um, reading the Word. I don't want you to be confused, and I'm going to do my best today to explain to you in clear terms what Daniel was seeing and um, how it applies to us today. And so um, one of the most glorious prophecies in all of Scripture is right here in Daniel chapter 9. Um, but it's also um, shrouded in mystery, and we really have to unpack it to see what all is in there. So beginning at verse 20, it says, Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, uh, my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And that means the evening time of prayer. You may recall how the psalmist said, at morning, at evening, and at noon will I pray. And it was the custom of Jewish people to pray three times a day. If they weren't in, the, if they weren't in Jerusalem where they could go to the temple, they would bow toward Jerusalem. And it was the time of evening prayer when this takes place. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Here it goes. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks... And 62 weeks. So he's dividing up the 70 weeks into three distinct time periods. The street shall be built again and the wall. You may want to mark that. That's very significant. Even in troublesome times and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is talking about this prince who is to come. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Here we have that term again that we saw Last week, an abomination that causes desolation. Even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Lord Jesus, give us understanding. May your Holy Spirit, who's the Spirit of truth, help us understand what your word is saying. May we be encouraged today to know that everything's happening according to your timetable and your time frame. Lord, we pray that you would come quickly. Lord, you would put an end to sin and usher in everlasting righteousness. Lord, we thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray again, if there's anyone here who's lost and doesn't know Jesus, that today would be the day they surrender everything to him. We give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. In Daniel 9, we have one of the most fascinating prophecies in all of Scripture. God not only reveals what will happen, but when it will happen down to the very day. In this passage, we will see God's plan to bring the world to its dramatic conclusion where Israel is restored, the church is ruling and reigning with Christ, Satan the Antichrist and all false prophets and doctrines have been done away with. It's a vision that again weakens Daniel to the point of exhaustion, yet no doubt thrills him to exhilaration. And again, while it might look for a while like Satan has gotten the upper hand, in the end, God wins. Again, the overwhelming theme of the book of Daniel is that in the end, God wins, his kingdom wins, his people who have endured will win, and we will rule and reign with him forever. God's people overcome because Christ overcomes. And we see in this, we see 70 weeks, we see the Antichrist depicted in this prince which is to come, and the great tribulation. Now we see first of all in the se- this vision overall about the 70 weeks, we see God's plan for consummation. In other words, how is it all going to end? How are we going to get to the end with Christ enthroned, with sin being done away with, and with everlasting righteousness being ushered in? And by the way, that is our blessed hope that Christ would return from glory. The blessed hope of every believer is the glorious appearing and the, of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, because when He comes, He is going to make all things new. He is going to make everything right. Everything that we see wrong today will be done away with and everlasting righteousness will come in. That's why John the Revelator wrote, Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because he knew, as we know, that the hope that we have, the hope that this world and this universe has, is that Christ will return from glory. Yet until that happens... There are going to be many hardships for God's people. And we see it determined around what what is revealed here to Daniel as 70 prophetic weeks. Now, just a little background. If you read the first part of the chapter, Daniel had been contemplating the prophecy that Jeremiah had made that Israel would be in exile for 70 years. Israel had to be in exile one year for every Sabbath year that they refused to keep, if you read the Old Testament. Every seventh year was to be a Sabbath year where the land would rest. And anything that grew, the strangers in the land that that they were to treat fairly, they could come in and they could glean whatever grew. They weren't planting crops, they were letting the land rest. But whatever God allowed to come up, the strangers in the land could come and they could glean from what had come up. Also, debts were to be canceled. And yet, like so many of us, God gives a command that's to be a blessing And yet in our pride, we decide we can find a way around it. And that's exactly what Israel did. They found a way around it so they weren't keeping it. They weren't being a blessing to the strangers that God had brought to them so that they might shine the glorious light of the God of heaven to the Gentile and pagan peoples of the world. They weren't keeping it. So God says, because you have failed to keep my command and you failed to be the light that God has called you to be, You're going to have to go into exile for one year for every Sabbath year you didn't keep. And they didn't keep, so for 490 years, they didn't keep the Sabbath year. And so God says, okay, that's 70 Sabbath years you didn't keep, so you're going to go into exile for 70 years. And Daniel, who had been taken in that first um, exile, when Nebuchadnezzar came in, he now as an old man is seeing that these 70 years are about to come to an end. And he's wondering and he's praying to God about when it's going to come to an end. When are the people of Israel going to be allowed to go back to the promised land? And he knew the time was getting close and he begins to pray and he's so burdened that in prayer that he begins to confess his own sins and the sins of his people Israel. 
and in this time of prayer, at the evening time, the evening time of prayer, the evening sacrifice or oblation is how the King James translates it. It means that evening time of prayer and dedication to God. In that time of prayer, God sends the angel Gabriel to him to show that these 70 years are also prophetic in that they are showing 70 weeks. So what are the 70 weeks? 70 weeks are actually 70 weeks of years. It can be translated 70 sevens or 70 periods of seven years that are determined on the holy people and on the holy city of Jerusalem until Christ ultimately returns and does away with sin and ushers in everlasting righteousness, putting an end to sin. Won't that be a glorious day? When sin is no more, when Satan is bound, and when righteousness flourishes throughout the earth. Seventy weeks are divided into three parts. Now these 70, year, these 70 periods of seven years, the years are not like we think. Daniel did not operate on what we call the Gregorian calendar or the 365-day year. Jewish people operated as well as Babylonian people where Daniel was at the time. They operated on a 360-day year that was based on the lunar cycles. So their years were shorter than our years today. So when he says there's 70 periods of seven years, he's talking about Jewish calendar years. And they were divided into three parts. There was seven weeks or 49 Jewish calendar years, and during that time they would rebuild Jerusalem during troublesome times. It says they would also rebuild the wall. Why is that significant? Because on March 5th, 444 BC, king, the Persian king Artaxerxes gave a decree to Nehemiah to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And that began this period of time that Daniel sees here in Daniel chapter 9. Then there's going to be 62 weeks or 434 Jewish calendar years from the time that Jerusalem gets rebuilt that where they are waiting for Messiah to come. Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem 483 Jewish calendar years from the day of the decree by Artaxerxes. That's historical fact. Down to the very day Jesus made his triumphal entry. That's why when Jesus came in and they're laying down palm branches and they're saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The scribes and Pharisees get so angry and they say, Tell them to be quiet. And he says, No, if they be quiet, the rocks themselves are going to cry out. Why? Because it was a day determined by God that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem 483 years after the decree to rebuild the wall, and that's exactly when it happened. Around 32 BC, March of AD, or AD, March of AD 32, Christ makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where then, just as Daniel said would happen, he's cut off. And he's not cut off for his own sin, he's cut off for the sins of his people. Aren't you glad Jesus went to a cross for us? Aren't you glad for that, that ultimate Passover that was fulfilled on that first, what we celebrate as Easter, that first, that ultimate fulfillment when Christ the Messiah came into Jerusalem just has been foretold on the day that it was told he would come. He is accepted as the Passover lamb. On the very day that the priests are choosing what lamb is going to be sacrificed for the sins of the nation, God Almighty already had a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, and he comes marching triumphantly into Jerusalem, fulfilling the scriptures, and during that week, he is cut off. Cut off for not for his own sins, but for our sins. Friends, that's why we have hope today. That's why we have hope of the ultimate fulfillment when Christ returns and, does it, uh, and completely does away with sin and everlasting righteousness is ushered in and we are forever with God in the saints of God, in the kingdom of God. That's why we have hope because Jesus took our place on a cross. 
Jesus shed his blood without which there would be no remission of our sins. And he is cut off for our sin. A perfect sinless Savior going to a cross, shedding his blood, saving the world. Just as had been told to the prophet Daniel. But then he says there's going to be one more week or one more period of seven years. And I believe we are still waiting for this week to begin. Why do you say that? Because it has a very definite beginning and a very definite end, and we have not seen anything like it yet in all of human history. It will begin when one who is of the people that come and destroy the city. Now, Daniel has shown here that after Messiah is cut off, not for his own sins but the sins of the people, He foretells of a group that will come and destroy the temple and destroy the city. And that's exactly what happened in A.D. 70 when Titus the Roman came in. But then he says a prince that is to come, which is of these people, is going to confirm a covenant with the people, with Israel, if you will, for one week or for seven years. And in the midst of it, it will be broken. But this is who we believe is who we call Antichrist. That as we saw last week, a world leader will arise in the end times who will unite the world. By the way, they're clamoring for that. Recently at one of the meetings of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab got up and he said, it's time for all the nations of the world to put their sovereignty aside for the good of the world. They need to do away with their militaries. They need to do away with their economies. And let's all unite for the good of the world. That's already in the works. Not saying that to scare you. It ought to excite you that we're living in the most exciting times in human history. When what was foretold thousands of years ago by the prophets of God are coming to pass. And possibly in our lifetime that we could be that generation that sees the return of Christ. And, and that excites me to no end. But there is coming a world ruler who is going to finally do what no one else has been able to do. And he's going to make peace between the Jews and the Arabs. And a temple, according to Ezekiel, there's a new temple that's going to be built. I don't got time to get into that. There is a group in Israel, by the way, called the Temple Institute that today is working to build a new temple. And this world leader will see it happen, yet in the midst of it, he's going to turn and he's going to declare that he himself is God, as we saw last week. One we call Antichrist. Now, there is a great difference between the Messiah, the prince, and the prince which is to come. The prince which is to come is a lowercase p. Messiah, the prince, is a capital P. Why? Because he's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. The son of God and the son of man. And there is great difference and we can draw a comparison between the two. Christ was cut off for the sins of his people. Antichrist will be cut off, will will cut off others because of his own sin. Christ is the son of man. The Antichrist is the man of sin. Christ is the prince of princes. Antichrist is the prince that shall come. Christ came in his father's name. He said, I come in my father's name and you did not receive me, but one is coming in his own name. Him you will receive. Christ came in the father's name. Antichrist comes in his own name. Here's the ultimate difference. Christ humbled himself and was exalted. Antichrist will exalt himself and in the end be humbled. So the question is, which one will you follow? Are you going to follow Jesus or the ways of this world? Are you going to follow Christ, the King of kings, or the kings and leaders of this world? Even if they tell us to go against the word of God, God's law always ought to trump man's law. And so we, we've got a choice to make. Are we going to worship Jesus or are we going to worship something else? Because ultimately... Worshiping anything else is going to lead to us worshiping Satan himself. And that is ultimately the question. Ultimately, the conflict is always over worship. 
Lucifer got kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be God and receive worship for himself. And his pride caused him to fall and become Satan, the serpent, the dragon, whatever you want to call him. But ultimately, it's about worship. And are you going to worship Jesus, the one who was cut off for our sins? Or are you going to worship the one who exalts himself, but in the end is going to be humbled? Christ versus Antichrist. But then we have conflict and conquest this 70th week that some refer to as the time of great tribulation. Great tribulation. Many have read books and seen things about the seven years of great tribulation that is to come. Where do they get that? They get it from this prophecy, this final week, that will happen whenever this prince which is to come makes a covenant with the people of Israel. So who will start it? The prince that is to come, this world leader. Who is this world leader? I don't know. Anybody that tells you they know who the Antichrist is, and you can get on YouTube and find all kinds of crazy videos about it. But anyone who tells you does not know what they're talking about, it will be revealed in its time, but we are not looking for Antichrist, we're looking for Jesus Christ. Our blessed hope is not figuring out who the Antichrist is so we can know exactly when it's going to happen or what's going to happen. Our ultimate hope is that Christ will return from glory, rescue his church, rescue his bride, and we'll be forever with him. But it will start when this leader, this prince which is to come, confirms a covenant for one week or seven Jewish calendar years. He will be of European descent. Why do you, how do you get that? Because it says he will be of the people that destroy the temple, and it was the Romans who destroyed the temple. He will be against God and against Christ, and he will speak blasphemous things against the Most High. When will it start? I believe it will start after the catching away of the church because it's a time of Jacob's troubles. The promises God made to Israel, he will fulfill. God is not a God who doesn't keep his promises. And he made promises to David and the house of David. Many have been fulfilled, but not all of them. And he, and he will keep his promises to them, yet they have to go through a time of trouble in order to get them to a place where they look upon him whom they have pierced and weep and mourn as for a firstborn son, according to Zechariah. It will happen after the signing of the covenant. The covenant between Israel and the other people of the area that ultimately will enter into this seven-year time period. What will happen during it? It will be a time, first of all, of diplomacy. He will finally get the Arabs and the Jews to agree to peace terms. But it will also be a time of deceit. He comes with a promise of peace but ends up bringing war. And chapters 11 and 12 talk of Daniel talk about all the wars that he brings. So he will promise peace, but end up bringing war. And it will be a time of destruction because halfway through the week, he commits what is called the abomination of desolation, claiming to be God, and he will destroy for three and a half years until Christ finally comes again with clouds and destroys him. And that brings us to the end. How will it all end? Christ comes. All the way. Coming with clouds. He comes in the clouds to catch away the bride. He will come with clouds to destroy all of his enemies with the brightness of his coming. Jesus is coming. One day he will come again and reclaim the throne, reclaim the world, reclaim the universe as his own, and he will set up his kingdom, that mountain that we saw in chapter 2, that kingdom of the Most High that we saw in chapter 7. It will be set up and it will have no end. The Antichrist will be defeated and destroyed. All the kingdoms of this world ultimately are destroyed and the kingdom of God comes. We get so tore up about the kingdoms of this world and how they're not acting right. How do you expect sinful people to act? They're going to act like sinners act until the time of the end when sin is no more. 
But there's coming a day when Christ returns and there will be peace on earth at last because the Prince of Peace is on the throne. Christ has returned. The devil and the Antichrist have been defeated and we will rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The saints will be given the kingdom in the end. So just hold on. You think you can run, run things better? You probably can and you'll get your chance. Just hold on. But ultimately it's going to be Christ ruling and reigning and us with him. So in closing, here's how we can bring this all together. Are you a true worshiper of the Lamb of God? Are you a true worshiper of the one who came and was cut off for your sins? Have you surrendered to him? Have you accepted his sacrifice? Because he made sacrifices for sin once and for all. And there's no more sacrifice. Either you accept the sacrifice that has been made, or you reject it to your own destruction for all of eternity. So are you a worshiper of the Lamb of God? Have you surrendered your life? to Jesus Christ? Have you aligned your allegiance? Because that's ultimately what it, what, it, what it is. It's allegiance. Is your allegiance to the Son of God? Is your allegiance to the Messiah, Jesus Christ? Is your allegiance to the one who suffered and died, yet rose from the grave and is ascended on high and seated at the right hand of the throne in power? Is your allegiance with him or is your allegiance with the leaders and kingdoms of this world? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? The time for choosing is now. We're not told to go home and think about it. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. See, in the New Testament, from the time Christ ascended, he just told them he's coming back and he didn't tell them when. He just said, I'm coming again. And it could be at any moment. So we have to choose today. Now's the accepted time. If you don't know 100% for sure you're ready to meet Jesus, you need to make sure today. If you, don't, if you know deep down inside your allegiance has been with someone or something else than Jesus Christ, you need to surrender everything to Christ as Lord of your life. You need to show publicly that commitment in your heart. Make a public stand for Jesus Christ. Is your allegiance to him? Have you surrendered your life to him? The time for choosing is now. Will it be Christ or will it be Antichrist? Will it be heaven or will it be hell? Will it be life or will it be death? And I close with the words of Moses, his final words to Israel before God took him, was this. I set before you today life and death. Choose life that you and your children might live. It is time to choose life, and life is only found in Jesus Christ. True life is found in the one who gave his life for us. He gave his life so that you and I might have eternal life and abundant life. Have you really surrendered your life to him the time for choosing is now. If everyone would bow your head and close your eyes.